We're back with Roger Harper. Roger, Lawrence Romeo asked, do you seek to get involved with cricket at any level again? When the time is right, yes. At the moment, you know, I've been involved with the Amazon Warriors at the CPL, and I, expect, and I will be involved again this year. So when the time is right, I'm sure. Carl asks, what is right and wrong about the West Indies team today? Well, the, I think uh, the inability to put consistent performances together. I don't think it is a matter of physical or technical ability. I think it's a matter of, 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 of I think our mental skills need strengthening. Our ability to manage our technical skills is what's letting us down on a number of occasions. In addition to that, um, the ability to apply ourselves over a long period of time, especially in the longer version of test, test matches, whether we are batting, or in the field is something that you know we don't do on a regular basis. Julian Charles, who was the quickest bowler you ever faced? I think the person that bowled the quickest of me would be Patrick Patterson. On reflection, which test game you West Indies lost that you felt could have been could have could have been one. And what, what was your reason? You mean a game that I was involved in? Yes, sir. But you have to understand, there were only two games I played in that we lost. <laughs> so, that was that was the era <laughs> then where West would lose too many. <laughs> and um, so that's that's. Uh, one doesn't jump out at me, really. Okay. Okay. All right. Because the, the, the games that we lost, we lost one in Sydney and one in Pakistan. I think we were both uh, really outplayed. Oh. And Julia Charles asked, who was the fastest run in the West Indies teams you, um, you, play, you played for? And he said he heard of Larry Gomes. Well, there was a race once or twice, and Larry Jones was third. There were two play people ahead of him, and Gus Logie was second. <laughs> were you ever tempted to go on a rebel tour to South Africa as, um, as Croft, Julian Charles again? No, I didn't have that temptation to deal with, not as I think I would have gone. Um, I was really a young player breaking onto the scene then. Okay. In the chat room, Terence asks, how would you rate your Guyanese contemporary, Carl Hooper? I think Carl is a fantastic cricketer. And I think um, even though a lot of people say that, you know, he didn't uh, fulfill his potential, he still um, has a, you know, quite a significant record. And um, when you watch Carl Bat, I think people have the, 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 the joy of forgetting all their troubles when you watch him really on the go because he's such a classical player. And um, no doubt about it, he's an outstanding um, player. Some say, or most say, your knowledge of the game and tactical skills are like second to none. And so how would you rate your tenure as captain of Guyana and of the A-team? I think um, we had a pretty good run. Mm -hmm. We were able to do uh, pretty well with the resources we had. And um, I think especially when the test players were not around, we showed that we really dominated and, you know, were really close to the the winning championships. But um, I think we managed to play together, pull for each other. And we had a few good players in there too. You mentioned Andrew Jackman earlier. Uh, of course, you can't forget uh, Clayton Lambert. Yes. I think uh, if I had to lead a guy in his team, I would always like to see him behind me. Wow. And um, of course, another person 
that um, played a tremendous part in the success of Guyanese cricket back in those days was Clyde Burks. Now, there's another player I'd like to see behind me if we're going to lead a Guyanese team because uh, he's always putting the team first, always willing to work hard, and he's an outstanding performer as well. I, and this is just something for us. I want you to take us back in time. Garfield, Charles, and Andy. Describe them as players. And Jackman? Yes. Well, and Andrew Jackman was, uh, you know, a, a very competent batsman. Technically, you know, he looked the part and an excellent player of spin bowling, liked to use his feet, loved to drive. And of course, you know, he fancied himself against the quick as well, as a quicks as well as a hooker. Mm. Garfield Charles, you know, very talented player. And I think um his talent was obviously underrated, but um, at school, he was an outstanding batsman, had all the shots, sometimes tried to play too many too quickly. <laughs> but, uh, I think when he, he, he went to trials for the Guyana 19 team, lack of opportunity with the bat, you know, he forced him to put a little more effort into on focus in his bowling. And so he progressed more as a bowler, but I think he never really totally lost his batting skill. And one year in Trinidad, when he somehow cajoled me to go with Night Watchman, he managed to make 100, you know, the following day <laughs> against Ranji Nana and company, it was an outstanding inning. <laughs> but on his day, on his day with the ball as well, he swung the ball around and on his day it was quite a handful. I remember one such day in, um, in Vincent, I think, where he had the ball dancing around, and if memory serves me correct, he took seven wickets in that inning. What? Wow. Oh, yeah. What type of captain do you believe you would have been for West Indies senior team if you were given the chance? Well, I think uh, my leadership style is, is simple. I like to uh, lead from the front, lead by example, and that means in terms of application and effort. And um, I think uh, any captain work is worth its salt would, would try and make sure you plan meticulously and include your team in those plans and make sure that they are equipped to execute the plans that you come up with. Roger, you kept your cool. You were young at a time when various people got the captaincy. And I'm just curious for young people listening to this, um, how did you manage your resolve how 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 did you deal with that when there was viv richards and then richie Rich richardson and then hooper walsh and then lara how did you how did you deal with that well one has to remember i don't think you can put uh is it richard's name in that bracket at all because uh one has to remember that those were really established players. I mean, Isaac, Vivian, Alexander Richards. Mm -hmm. I think it was automatic that once Clyde Lloyd left, left the scene that he would uh, take over the mantle of leadership. But um, Richie Richardson was not an outstanding player. And um, someone like me who, wasn't, who was in and out of the team hadn't really cemented a place long term in the final 11. It's always going to be difficult. Okay. Mm -hmm. Did you have a vision for the youth team when, when you took over, I think, as manager? And, and did you accomplish that vision or parts of it? Well, actually, uh, I managed the West Indies youth team very briefly. And that would have been for the preparatory camp. Mm -hmm. I left for Kenya following that and didn't actually go to the World Cup with the team. I think Jimmy Adams took that team to the World Cup. I, I want to I arc back to, to, to ask you about Kenya, but I'm going to go to the chat room for a bit. Terence asked, said, you mentioned Clayton Lambert. What is your assessment of Andrew Light? Oh, Andrew Monster Light. 
Uh, that was one of the players that inspired me as well because that guy was fearless. As captain, you never ask Andrew, if you won the toss, you never ask him what to do. Not only one answer you would get, but he didn't care whether you had lightning and thunder bowling against him, whether it was pitch dark, whether the pitch was wet, it was dry, it was glass, whatever. He backed himself to bat and get runs. And he feared no man or any situation. You know, I have a lot of time. He worked hard, he trained hard, and he played hard. I have a lot of time for Andrew Light. He's a really an outstanding player. I think, um, but he got ill, and his illness slowly started to take his toll. Mm -hmm. And from the quality players he was, you know, his performance deteriorated drastically over a period of time. And I think that was because of his illness. If you had an opportunity to be in a room with Clive Lloyd, Viv Richards, um, Ron Kanai, Garfield Sobers. You have one question for each. What would you ask? Uh, that is something that hasn't crossed my mind, but I know what the discussion will be. <laughs> Tell us, Roger. Tell us, man. How can we get West Indies cricket back to where it belongs? Because surely I've been around some of these guys in recent times. And um, last year, I've been in a room with a number of the names you call, except uh, Can I? Oh. And that's what the guys are talking about. And I think they're distraught at fact that West Indies cricket has declined in the manner in which it has and you know they would really like to see it back to where they had worked so hard to build it up to be. Do you think it's possible? Of course it's possible. Mm -hmm. of co Listen, we dominated world cricket when we had a president, a treasurer, and a secretary, more or less, running your board, oh. right? But I think you had a greater commitment to the game and the territorial board's function in the sense of preparing players to get to the, to be able to perform and compete and dominate at the highest level. Everything was geared towards going to the top and being able to perform at the international level. And like I said earlier, I think we have to revisit some of the things that brought us success, see what can be implemented in an improved manner, and um, try and see if we can do just that. But of course, the focus has to be on taking the cricket forward and not on anything else. Mm -hmm. Kenya. Tell us a little bit about coaching in Kenya. What was that like? It was a tremendous experience. Uh -huh. tremendous experience. Um, of course, cricket is not a game that every Kenyan understands and plays. But those that do are very passionate about it. And there are not a, a lot of clubs uh, because of the huge Asian fraternity that um, compete very seriously on weekends and have professional cricketers that come over from India and Pakistan. But, um, and the odd one from, you know, Australia or England. But um, I worked for the Kenyan cricket. Association, and um, we were able to set up a program where I was able to work with the players uh, five days a week, and they responded very well. And we had a lot of fun together. We worked hard. We had a lot of fun together as well. We won the World Cricket League, which enabled us to 
to compete in the first uh, T20, ICC T20 World Cup competition. And uh, of course, we were part of the World Cup again in 2007 as well in the Western Indies. What did coaching in Kenya teach you? That there's a lot more to coaching than coaching. <laughs> You also coach the, the, the West Indies team, right? Well, I say that about Kenya because um, Kenya, Kenyan cricket has been plagued by player strikes. Mm -hmm. And of course, the problems between the board and the players. And of course, like um, just like Guyana, we have situations with their um, they feel that uh, they have a lot of Asian players and African players, and some feel that some players are treated better than the others. So there are a lot of issues to deal with. But the challenge is, be, is being able to, you know, to treat everyone fairly, deal with them honestly, and represent both parties in the manner in which they should be represented. I think when the players need to be represented, you know, you, uh, I was able to represent them as far as speaking to the board about their bringing their grievances to the board when I think they were treated unfairly. And as well, I was able to, to convey to the players what the expectations of the board was of them, what those expectations were. And um, I think uh, both parties respected me for that because it never really took any size. We was able to be with each of them clearly and respectfully. Roger, what's your advice for young players these days? Decide what is it you want to achieve early mm -hmm. and try and lay a path out and work towards it. I think um, with a number of distractions around these days and a lot of players get caught up by those distractions and i think they really have to focus on what they want to achieve and try and develop their skill to the level that's going to allow them to achieve the goals that you know they really set uh i i, I think that a lot of our players that are, don't really commit to their goals in the manner in which they should mm -hmm. and don't really work as hard as achieving them and I don't think a worthwhile goal is just about being able to get into a West Indies team. That should be one of the steps on the way to your, your goal, really. I think we, we have to work at being world-class players so we can dominate the world again. If you can't be better than the Virat Kohli's of this world, then you're going to struggle. Roger, I want to, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. I'm sitting here listening to you. I, I, I have to say you'll be an, an, an amazing and excellent motivational speaker. But I want to go back in time. I, I, first of all, condolences to the passing of your mother recently. But let me ask you this. May I ask you about her? Is it okay? Of course. All right, cool. So when you were young, Queen's College, and then you went to play for the for Guyana and the West Indies and so on. What was her reaction that you took this particular path? What was her reaction? Mm -hmm. Well, when I got into Queen's College, one of the things my mother did was one day when she came to Queen's College with me, she took me into the hall and looked at the honors board and showed me the honors scholars. And on that board was one Monty Oliver Harper, my father's brother. So she said that I will be the other Harper that will go on that board. So need I tell you um, what was her reaction? But like our parents, I think, um, you know, she wanted a doctor yeah. or a lawyer or something like that. 
But I think in the end, she was quite happy to settle for an international cricketer. What words of wisdom? Because we grew up hearing a lot from our parents. Do you remember from either of them, either parent? But let's let's stick with mom. That still resonates with you today. Well, firstly, my mother didn't believe that you should procrastinate. Mm -hmm. If something's done, you get it done. You know, leaving it for tomorrow. Or you have of it for tomorrow. Right? See, if you get it done now, you'll sleep comfortably. <laughs> you have to think that you have to get it to do something, you wouldn't sleep properly at all. So finish it. And um, she instilled in us the, the value of hard work, of being fair, and, um, you know, not giving up. Mm. And the other thing that she kept drumming to your heads is that a good name is worth more than silver and gold. A good name? Worth more than silver and gold. Uh, I, I receive that. I receive that. If you were to eavesdrop a conversation your mother or your, or your parents telling a stranger about you. What do you think your mom would say? And then tell us about your dad after. How would, it, how would they describe you? Well, I think you should ask my brother that question. Mark. What my mom would say, what my mom would say about me, because he likes to <laughs> dress it up as to what he thinks that my mother would say about me. But I think... Um, my mother was very proud of me. Um, she knew that, um, I think, without a doubt, I was her favorite child. And, um, you know, she gave me a lot of love. She gave all our children a lot of love. But I think um, you know, I got a little special attention being the last. Mm -hmm. and in return, I reciprocated that, you know. Yeah. Um, I was always proud and happy of the fact that my parents always took great care of me. I never needed anything. I mean, I wanted a lot, but I never needed anything. And um, they worked hard to make sure that we can get what we needed to achieve in life. And um, that was nothing more that I, I was always willing to repay that debt the best I could. I don't think we could ever repay that debt, but, um, you know, we tried to do what we can. Mm -hmm. And I was delighted that... Um, you know, I had the opportunity to share her last couple of years with her because she stayed here in, at her home with us, with my wife and I. Mm -hmm. and, um, yeah, that uh, brought a sense of satisfaction that, you know, they were to repay some of that debt anyway. And that debt anyway. And um, I know that... Um, she put a lot into bringing us up. Mm -hmm. My father as well, but he was more laid back. My mother was the driving force in the family, so to speak. Don't we all know that? <laughs> Mark, right? Mm -hmm. Almost six years older than you. Good cricket player. What was it like growing up, playing the game, having a brother like Mark around? Well, it was easy for me in a sense that I learned so much because of him. Mm -hmm. you know, he's always talking about cricket, you know, reading and telling me what he was reading, giving me the books to read, or I would read it after him, whatever. So I was just, I just had to sit in his slipstream, and I learned so much. I mean, even today, if we ever speak on the phone, we're always talking about cricket. If we ever see each other, we talk. The conversation must drift around the cricket. And um, I think I benefited a lot because I was his younger brother, because mm -hmm. of, he was such a fanatic about cricket. Was, was the, one of the hmm, most memorable advice he has ever given you about the game? Um, I think it's, it, it's about um, being patient and applying yourself. And... and uh, I can't think of any one thing, but I think some of the things that he would remind me of from time to time, and I think he was good at this, is just, um, you know, when you think you're just getting ahead of yourself or not doing things the way that, you know, he knows you should or capable of doing it, he just remind you of where you need to be, what you need to do, and how you've done, dealt with similar situations in the past. Lawrence Romeo. What are your plans to get cricket played in schools again? 
I'm still trying to figure that one out. I think uh, we're trying to encourage the Ministry of Education and Sport to collaborate and to them to make um, sport on the whole part of the school curriculum. You see, my, this is a pet peeve of mine actually, because I think that we don't just go to school to develop academically, because some students are not academically inclined. And if we don't offer them opportunities to develop the skills that they are good at, and they really want to have an opportunity to develop, then they become disinterested and those are the ones that will be out on the street robbing you. But if we can get the guys who are not, might not necessarily be academically inclined to showcase their skills and develop it in, in sport or woodworking, art and drama, then we're creating avenues for our people to grow and become somebody. And I think this is what school did for us in the past. And even the ones that were academically inclined were more rounded because they had exposure in a number of areas. And I think that it's sad that you know things have progressed as far as people like to think that the world has progressed. But in some cases, I really do not see it. Hmm. Lauren Sachs, what is your opinion on the state of the West Indies Cricket Board? The state of the West Indies Cricket Board? Yes. I don't think I'm allowed to say that on here. Okay. Now, his last question. What's what, this? No, no. I was being facetious when oh. I said that. I don't think I, I, I'm allowed to give an honest opinion. <laughs> but I really think that, um, you know, our, our leaders, or some of them, have tried to put things right. But again, we see that CARICOM cannot hold one head, cannot come to a consensus. And while they may agree, they do different things and operate differently. But I think with astute leadership of our cricket, our administration, that our players will do a lot better. Because I think we have greater focus on the cricket as a whole. And out of that, we'll be able to build and develop and our team to perform more consistently. And I think the relationship with our board would improve as well. I don't think that you can expect to, cons to, to compete consistently with the best teams in the world when your best players aren't available on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, what are you most proud of? I am proud of the fact that um, I've managed to achieve to a certain level what I set out to achieve. And the fact that, you know, I'm still the same old humble Roger Harper. Mm -hmm. If you could go back in time, what would you tell that 15-year-old Roger? I would tell that 15-year-old Roger that, um, you know, Work harder, work smarter, and try and see if you can keep it for longer because in the year 2050, there will be a lot more money to be made in cricket. <laughs> Someone asked me to ask this question. I almost forgot it. I'll call some names and just tell me what immediately comes to mind. Sir Garfield Sobers. Oh, without doubt, Mr. Cricket, the greatest player in my mind still the game has ever seen. Um, a number of players wrapped up in one. He would make most teams in any part of the world just for his batting. And he would command a place in most teams as well for his bowling because he offered you a variety of styles as a, an outstanding swing bowler, uh, an orthodox spinner who was very capable, and of course a Chinaman Google bowler as well that come with a lot of batsmen. So, and of course, not to forget that he was a, a fantastic catcher anywhere in the field. So, um, I think that, um, you know, people respect and regard him as the greatest player there ever was. Ron, can I? Fantastic batsman. Mm -hmm. A 
great player. And I think a lot of people really think that he was really a, a class player and not given the sort of um, as much recognition as he should be. But um, I think in Guyana here, we know how good he is. In the West Indies, a lot of people still speak of him. Alvin Kalitoran. Another high quality player, you know, and played very well on difficult tracks as well. Mm -hmm. Lance Gibbs. Oh. You know, I saw him earlier tonight, actually, and uh, he did... Uh, you saw him tonight? Yes, he's in Guyana for the uh, international cricket. Gosh. And uh, he was over the Demerara Cricket Club. I... But, uh, of course, a legend, in, <laughs> yeah, legend, no doubt about it, you know. If there was a spinner who was uh, more aggressive than Lance, it's hard to... <laughs> but um, he was really an outstanding player, and one who had tremendous confidence in himself and uh, was able to bowl and, and, and trouble the batsman on most tracks because he was a prodigious spinner of the ball. And, you know, he really backed himself. Gavaskar. Oh, master batsman, master <laughs> bat. He had a bat that looked very broad when you bowled it. <laughs> wow, wow. Um, Lawrence Rowe. Oh, classical. Classical. That's another batsman that, you know, you when you watch him bat, you know, you can just feel so relaxed. Uh -huh. The way he caressed the ball. Wow. Of course, except if you were the bowler. <laughs> Vivian Richard. Oh, the master blaster, no doubt about it. I think uh, dominant. And he liked, to, liked bowlers to know that he was in charge. Wow. And last but not least, Clive Lloyd. Leader supreme. Mm. Leader supreme. And I think that um, West Indies cricket is highly respected today, even though we're struggling because of what he was able to achieve as a leader of the team, followed by Viv Richards, because of the path that he set the team on. And I think that uh, people fell in love with the West Indies team the team because of the way it performed on such a consistent basis. But they, 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 they fell in love and they respected the team. And I think his leadership, his vision, because Rudy Webster tells a story of um, sitting with Clyde Lloyd in a cafe in Australia after they had lost, uh, West Indies had been beaten 5-1 in the Test Series in 75-76. And Lloyd telling him that they were West Indies were going to dominate world cricket in the near future and, and laid out his plan. What? And Rudy Webster often tells that story. Wow. So he had his plan. He was able to implement his plan and ensure that it was executed very well. My God. Roger, what makes you laugh out loud? No, like everyone else, I like a good joke. Just that um, I appreciate the fact that there's a time and place for everything. But I like a good joke. I like uh, recalling uh, scenes from the olden days, mm -hmm. you know, but sharing time with uh, close friends from, you know, my younger days and days gone by. And spending time, of course, with family because a lot of moments sometimes where people see nothing funny and you know, just turn out to be funny to me for some reason or the other. But um, some people actually think I'm very serious, but really and truly, you know, I love a laugh like everyone else. <laughs> Roger, thank you so much. I really appreciate this, man. I, had a, I, I hope if there's any question that I didn't ask you, can you think of one? At the moment, Selwyn, it doesn't come to me. Good, good. But um, it was a pleasure being here this evening. And I hope that um, those listening enjoyed it and that uh, they got a little insight into Roger Hart. Thanks again, brother. You're most welcome. All right, man. Take care.
Okay, you too. Good. Bye. Bye.